Welcome to what is, according to me, another fascinating part of language teaching and learning, and that is improving your language accuracy and fluency. You might think, aha, I have studied English, yeah, or my mother tongue is English, I don't need to do any work on this, but in fact not. If you graduated from university and you had studied English and teaching, in all probability, that was the high point of your English and that, in fact, it will have dropped. And if you are a native English speaker, be warned that in the ESL world, everyone recognizes that your competence drops when you start teaching a limited syllabus. So if you're teaching just the syllabus in a few books, yeah. If you're simplifying your language all the time for your learners, your language competence will drop. We know this. So all of us as language teachers and learners, we need to focus on our accuracy and fluency. But there is more. So let me read you something from this book called Language Myths. I'll post it further down in this slide and then you can see for yourself if you wish. But let me read it to you first. All languages change all the time. It is not very well understood why this is the case, but it is a universal characteristic of human languages. The only languages which do not change are those like Latin, which nobody speaks. Languages change their pronunciation through time. For example, 500 years ago, all English speakers used to pronounce the K in knee, as in knee. Now, nobody does. Grammatical structures also change. English speakers used to say, saw you my son. Now, everyone says, did you see my son? But the most obvious way in which languages change is in the usage and meaning of words. Now, that's a very, very good point for us to recognize. Language evolves. We want to be good and competent as teachers. We need to keep evolving. We also need to recognize that there's a lot in language that we don't know about and a lot that we need to learn. So in this talk, this presentation, we're going to cover a number of different areas. One, I'm going to start straight off with some what I think are some simple solutions for um, building accuracy and fluency in language. Second thing we're going to look at is general strategies for improving your listening and speaking skills. Third thing we want to look at is some particular exercises for improve, improving fluency. Obviously, <laughs> mine is not very good. Then I'm going to mention just briefly a book by Swan and Smith, where you can see all the L1 interference factors going from Chinese to English. And the final thing that I'm going to look at is what are some particular learning challenges that we probably have if we are teachers in China and also the learning challenges that we have as teachers internationally, perhaps because we haven't really understood some of the concepts in language. Some many years ago when I was living in Italy, I had the occasion to meet a woman who had arrived in Rome to practice her violin. I was very impressed. I loved the violin. So I said to her, well, that's great. What are you practicing? And she said, my bow stroke. Just my bow stroke. She wasn't practicing fingering, she wasn't practicing pieces, she was only practicing her bow stroke. Why? Because there was something in her bow stroke that was stopping her developing as a violinist of very high standard. She was already very good, but there was something in how she was using her arm with the bow that was stopping her from being very good. 
For us as language teachers and language learners, this can also be the case, that there are some simple things in our language that are getting in the way of higher achievement. So I've got a little task which I'd like to suggest that you do. Um, you can stop this video at any point if you like and then complete the task, but this is how it goes. I'd like you to think for two minutes about your life as a teacher. When you've, when you've done that, so you probably need to set your timer first. You do that, you think for two minutes, you can write some notes, but definitely no sentences. Yeah. So you can write some notes to help your memory if you like. And then after you've done that, after two minutes, then set your timer and write as fast as you can, as much as you can for three minutes. At the end of that three minutes, I'd like you to take that piece of paper and count the number of words. Yeah. And then divide that number of words by three so that you have the number of words that you can write in a minute. Make a note of it because when you repeat this, when you do it again and again, you will find that your writing fluency increases. This is also a task that you can do with your learners. But after you've done that, then you have got a piece of writing that you have done with a little bit of time pressure and it will reveal for you a number of the errors that you normally make. You will ask, how will I know what my errors are? And that's a very, very good point. What you will do then is you will give your writing to someone else or better still swap so you will have found a partner who will have done the same task and then you swap. When you get their work and they get yours, you write a comment on it, remembering that in language, the most important thing is the meaning. So you comment on the meaning. And as teachers, of course, we do this when our students write, we comment first on the meaning. So we look at the meaning and you write something like, oh, I think your life as a teacher is fascinating or mm, that sounds really tragic or pretty much as I expected and similar to mine. You've done that. You've both commented on one another's writing and then you keep their piece, they keep yours, and you find three errors, if you can, three errors. So three mistakes in meaning, grammar, lexis, and you correct them, yeah? And they correct yours, then you discuss them. What's this? Why do you think it's that? Da, da, da. What's the problem? You will make a note of the errors that you made, and more importantly, you will diary forward a revision of that so, and remembering that sort of spiraled learning. So coming back to what you have learned to check it and memorize it is a critical part of learning. So in what is a very simple task and a task that you can repeat on a regular basis, you will get to identify, isolate and remove some of your basic errors in language. How was your weekend? It was wonderful, but now I feel really tired. How was your weekend? It was wonderful, but now I feel really tired. How did you do? Or how did we do there? Did you get most of those words? Did you identify some of them? If you identified all of them, very good. If you didn't, well, also very good because that is a learning opportunity for us. Now, what I want you to do now is a little bit more challenging. I want you to listen to that again and again and think about it as a melody. Think about it as a kind of music. And when you're listening to that music, listen to the rises and the falls, listen to the linking and a number of other different things before we move to the next part of our analysis. Pause the video now, if you like. Now we move to a really exciting part. 
and this exciting part is looking at the musicality of voice looking at the sound what we want to do is have a sound system that is accessible internationally so when we are speaking with someone from another country they can get what we are saying they can get our feeling they can get the naturalness of our language it does not have to be a standard UK English or a standard American English it does not we know that there are many many different accents in English that are completely acceptable but within that we also want to signal that our competence in language is high and the best way to do that is in the naturalness of your voice so what we want to look at with the recording is a little bit of analysis of what it actually sounds like so you've got a task and that task is to write down how was your weekend it was wonderful, but now I feel really tired. Write that down, big letters, a lot of space between the two lines. When you've done that, listen again to the audio and identify on the audio where the voice is fast, where it's slow, where the voice pauses a little bit or a lot rather, a little pause or a very small pause. Listen and draw some lines where the voice goes up or down over words. You can draw a line where the voice goes up or down on one word. You can identify with a little box where the stress is. So, for example, in the word outrageous, yeah, outrageous, we know the stress is on that syllable. You can identify where the, the words join. Can I? Can I? And you can also identify where sounds disappear. So not I want to, but I want to. Nice challenge. OK, let me leave that with you for a little while while you listen to that audio again and again and try and make these notes on your page. And then we will go to the next part of this presentation and see how you did. How was your weekend? It was wonderful, but now I feel really tired. How did you do? I know that the probability of your getting all of these lines and stresses and joinings correct is quite low. And to a certain extent, there's an element of interpretation on my part in this. The thing that you will discover is that in doing this, your whole awareness of sound goes up. And the result of that is you get more naturalness in your voice. I would recommend that you do this, that you find other audio texts that you can do it with, and you get your students to do it in your classroom. You will be amazed at how quickly they go from not recognizing the number of words and not recognizing rises and falls and everything else to becoming very good at it. And when they do, you will see a remarkable improvement in the sounds of their voice. Strangely, most of the time we have no idea what we are doing. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean that we have minimal awareness of what it is that we're saying or how we're saying it. In the same way that a ballet dancer might dance very well, but he or she will practice in front of a mirror. So their awareness of what they're getting right in their form and what they're getting wrong in their form is very high. So as language teachers and learners, we want to import that same degree of awareness. What we're going to do, what you can do and pause this video for it, is you're going to make a recording on your phone, on your voice app on your phone of just one minute and talk about what you did yesterday. Easy, yeah? One minute talking about what you did yesterday. Actually not easy. Suddenly, when you pick up that phone, you feel like, oh, goodness, what am I going to say? But you need to get over that because this is something you're going to do again and again. Remember, like the violinist, we're trying to remove some of those basic high frequency errors. So you think briefly about yesterday, not a lot, 
Yeah, there's not a lot of content in there that you have to think about. Think about it very briefly, then record your voice. After one minute, stop. And after that one minute, listen to what you have said and write down exactly what you have said. Not approximately, not maybe, don't change it. Write down exactly what you've said. So if you go, um, ah, uh, ah, uh, write that down, yeah? It, every single thing you say, write it down. When you've done it, then you get the test. You take that audio and you give it to a colleague and you say, this is my voice and this is what I wrote down. Can you check that they're one and the same? Almost all the time, people get it wrong. What they write down is not what they actually said. So if you do that, and then you write down what you've said, and you've showed it to your colleague, and they've looked at it, and then you've gone, goodness, I've missed those. Then you make a little note of those things is something that you didn't hear. And also you can start to make a note about the errors you may have made in your language. So get that good colleague, the one that you work with a lot, the one who also wants to be better in their fluency and accuracy in language and work with them. You can listen to their recording, they can listen to yours, you can compare notes and identify the things that you can improve on. There's a reasonable probability that there will be similar things that you can improve on together. So very, very good um, cooperative task to do, but better still if we have more precise guidance. So you can talk about what you have done and how good or not so good it is and what you can improve, or you can have focused attention to particular things. So in the next slides, what I want to look at is the kinds of things that you can remark on. Remembering that what we are looking for here is fluency and accuracy, we want to start in our voices demonstrating that we have that. One of the indicators of fluency is word speed and response time. And usually when folk are not fluent, they do a lot of pausing before they talk. In fact, one of the, the things that you can use as an examiner, or I used to use as an examiner, is by watching your learners when they're talking to you, you can see how much thinking they have to do before they reply. If they need to think a lot, that almost always means that their fluency is low because they need more time to access the vocabulary or grammar that they wish to use. So that's the first thing you might want to comment on in your partner's work or they might want to comment on in yours. The second thing that you might want to look at is how easy or hard does it look for you or for your partner to talk? Bearing in mind that our objective is to develop a more internationalized English sound that won't be present if it sounds difficult for you to express yourself. So if it does sound difficult for you to express yourself, what that means is that your vocabulary is probably all very passive. Your ability to access natural language is quite low. So this would indicate that you need a little bit more practice in terms of dealing with um, fluent expression. The next thing that we want to look at is when you are speaking to someone, do you use a good number of connecting words? Yeah, so when you're explaining what you did, do you just do sentence, 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 or do you connect them with all those wonderful conjunctions that we have available in English? Hi, how was your weekend? How was your weekend? How was your weekend? 
Do I sound like I'm teaching a class? Maybe I do. Sometimes as teachers, we will model language like that for our learners. What are you doing tomorrow? Everyone, what are you doing tomorrow? But this does not have the musicality or the melody in the language that we are trying to teach and which you are trying to model. So be aware of that, that when you're speaking, you want to engage a certain amount of musicality or melody in your language. You also want to make sure that there's variety. So when you're listening to your partner, what they have said, ask yourself, is there variety in the pace or is it all at the same speed? Is there variety in the pace or is it all at the same speed? Make a note of that because that's one of the indicators of fluency, which is that we tend to use high frequency expressions quite quickly. And then when we're thinking about something slightly different, our voice speed changes. You can comment on that for your partner. Do you place your sentence stress on appropriate parts of the language? Do you place your sentence stress on appropriate parts of the language? Now, do you place your sentence stress on appropriate parts of the language? The two obvious words there, stress and appropriate, they give you most of the meaning of that utterance. It's much easier for someone listening to you if they can hear the key sounds, which means that their brains can ignore the rest. We really do not want to listen to each word that is stressed because that tells our brain that word has special meaning. Yeah. So when you're speaking, try and get stress on appropriate parts of the language. So do you join words or do you join words? Yeah. Do you join words? Do you join words? When you're doing that, there's you get an opportunity, obviously, to sound a lot more natural, but you also get the opportunity to provide a better, better model for your learners. Um, when you're doing that, you're doing you're making comments on what your colleague is doing, but you're also learning from that about what you can do. OK, let's have a little bit of fun here. Imagine that I go home and my wife says to me, how was your day? I say, good. She says, how was lunch? I say, good. She says, how was your trip home? I say, good. She will think, strangely, she will think that I don't really want to talk to her that I'm not really interested in the conversation because limited vocabulary tends to suggest that you can't really be bothered to say more than the minimal. So overusing very simple vocabulary is not a good model for your learners, but also not a very good model for your thought process. So for example, how was your day? Oh, it's really interesting, actually. I had some trouble with, with some children, but um, I spoke with the principal about them, and he's talking to the parents, so they should be fine. How was your lunch? Oh, fantastic. I had lunch in the school canteen. How was your trip home? Oh, not too bad. Um, the bus was very, very packed. Um, yeah. Um, not ideal really, but I got home, so that's the important thing. So when you reply or when your partner has replied, think about the variety, think about the range of language that you can use. Now, um, next point, okay, it's it's all case by case really. Um, when, when conversations are very simple, well then it's relatively easy to say what you want to say. But if we talk on something that's a little bit more than simple, then we really need to have some active vocabulary in here that we can access. 
if we don't have that, then the conversation slows or we get too broad in our meaning and we don't convey things very clearly. So if this is an issue for you or your partner, then you can do things like look at the West general service list, or you could look at the um, academic word list or a number of other things to improve the range of vocabulary you've got. So we might also look at the kind of words that we use. Do we always rely on general words? Yeah. So the example that we're using here is I walked up a road. Road is very, very general. Yeah. It may not have been a road. It might have been an alley or a path or a walkway. And we've mentioned this already in how do you say that another way. But having the language necessary to be specific makes the information clearer and makes our communication clearer and makes us better models as language users. I got up, I had breakfast, I went to work. Clear, simple, but probably not very informative, probably not very interesting, but it's the kind of language that we tend to teach. It's the kind of language that our learners tend to learn. Um, and it means that their ability to sound fluent, their ability to make long and relatively interesting sentences is gone. We want to encourage as much as possible in ourselves and in our learners and in our colleagues that we work for more than simple little sentences go for the complex, try and extend your language. When you are speaking or when your colleague has spoken, are they using very, very simple um, sentences or are they having helping clauses so that they are more complex? For example, I went to work, I met a teacher, he helped me. I went to work and met a teacher who helped me. Yeah, same, exactly same ideas, but joined in such a way that as a listener, you don't have to listen to three sound bites. Yeah, you don't have to listen to three different ideas. You just listen to one. Yeah, so when you're when you're speaking, try and get helping clauses into your language to help not only yourself, but help your listener. Now, in your work or in your partner's work, are they tending to use simple present, simple grammar a lot, or do they have variety? So, for example, um, and you can think of all the, um, you know, the standard ones that we use again and again. But, for example, let me just say something like yesterday when I was working in a cafe, I met a friend of mine and we talked about what we were going to do in August. And it was very exciting to talk about that. I asked him if he had made any plans and he said he hadn't. Okay, within that you'll see there's a very big variety in the grammar. There's a big variety in the tenses that are expressed to to express differences in meaning. Is your language like that? Is your partner's language like that? Are you deliberately trying to express greater clarity by your mastery of grammar or tense structures in English? Generally speaking, how is your partner's language? Is it fairly correct most of the time? And normally that's okay because we all, we all make strange mistakes in our language on, on a regular basis? Or is the part your partner's language got a good number of systemic errors? In other words, do they make the same error all the time? So that's quite a lot in terms of the comments that you can make on your partner's recording and you probably don't want to do that all the time but it will give you a good awareness of the kinds of things that you can target in your spoken language to move it to a higher level of fluency and accuracy.
we have got a lot to do as teachers and probably we don't want to spend a lot of time exploring grammar, exploring memorizing lists of Lexis and so on. Um, and also probably because that's not really that good for developing fluency and accuracy. Certainly, if you have vocabulary challenges, well then reminding yourself or reading more or checking the Lexis lists I have mentioned already, that's a good thing. But really for development and fluency, we need exposure. Yeah, we need input from things that are interesting, relatively easy and things that we can do a lot. And one of the good examples of that is listening to music that we have decided we enjoy. So if you can find a song in English that you enjoy, great. Then download the lyrics if you can, read the lyrics, think about them, not too much, yeah, because this is not an analysis of Jane Austen, yeah, this is looking at some lyrics and listening. So you do that and you can ask yourself a little bit about what they mean if you like it, memorize it and keep it for your next karaoke event. Um, when you're listening to it, follow the lyrics with your finger. You know already that if the voice is fast, your finger's fast. If the voice is slow, then your finger is slow. And in all of those things, you're developing awareness of things like changes in speed and patterns in language and music. So a really nice, interesting way to develop your awareness. And of course, because music is easy to listen to, you can listen to it again and again. And in that, you're embedding some nice, bits of language that you'll be able to use in your real life as a teacher and as a person. A couple of interesting tasks here. Both of them are focused on listening and speaking skills. The first one that we want to look at is repeat it. And the second one is summarize. Now in repeat it, you need a partner, just find that colleague that you like working with, someone who is um, a little bit kind, a little bit understanding, and also a little bit careful in their language. So find them and work with them. The task that you can do together is repeat it. Simple as that. You say something, your partner repeats it. Don't make it too long because you don't want them to die young, but get say seven to 10 words and then stop and your partner can repeat it. Now what will happen is that they will try and repeat exactly what you have said. Yeah, you will probably notice whether or not they've done that. Yeah, now in that awareness that they've got of what you have said and your awareness of what they have said, you get an increased awareness of what you said and how clear and how accurate it is. And often when we're doing something which someone else is going to copy, we tend to raise our performance. So it's a really good task for improving our fluency and accuracy. If you're doing this with your partner and it's very easy for them, make it more complex. Extend the number of words and give them more challenge in terms of their listening. But do also listen to any feedback they give you about the clarity or accuracy of your language. So that's number one. Number two, which is a different kind of listening, is focusing on meaning. And it's about actively summarizing what your partner has said. So you can do scissor, paper, rock, for example, and the winner can say something about anything at all, and then the other person summarizes it. Very good exercise in terms of your own listening skills. How good are you at listening to the content? And then as far as your partner is concerned, how clearly and accurately do they feel you have expressed their meaning? So two good tasks focusing on accuracy and overall competence in listening skills.
you know, there was a time in the history of language learning when there was a lot of translation as the language learning task, and it wasn't very successful. Not because there's anything wrong with translation, but because there was too much of it and the reason was perhaps wrong. If you can work with a partner and do a translation task, it's very good awareness raising for what they mean and how you want to translate that into English or what you mean and how they translate that into English. So a very good way of also removing um, L1 interference factors, especially if you have read through Swan and Smith at the end of this, then when you when you say something and your partner translates it, you may discover that there's an error in their language use or an error in their meaning. So it's a few minute task. You can do it with that same wonderful colleague. You could do it on a daily basis. And in that translation, you're finding what the potential errors are in your language. In a few minutes that you have at lunchtime or in break or at the end of the day, find that partner that you can work with and do one of these activities with them. Just for a bit of fun, you can play disagree. Yeah, and the rule of this of this particular game is fairly straightforward. Your partner says something, you have to disagree with it. So they can say to you, I think you are beautiful, and then you have to disagree. I don't think I'm beautiful because la 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 la. So you can have a lot of fun with that, little bit of practice, a few minutes of language, good for extending your vocabulary and building your fluency. So that's number one. Number two is a little bit difficult and a little bit challenging. So in this one, uh, one of the partners says something about their day or their life. Yeah. And then their partner asks probing questions. Now, probing questions are not normally the questions that you ask. So if, for example, um, your partner said, I won't, went home last night and I had dinner with my family. And then you could say, how is your relationship with your husband? Yeah, um, okay, it doesn't have to be that direct, but a probing question is one that is a little bit different from the normal and perhaps a little bit too private. But in doing that, you're getting a bit of entertainment and a bit of interest and extension in your language use.